right, we're ready to rock and roll here. Um, so uh, welcome today. Uh, welcome to Teaching and Learning Above the Line. All right, let's get this thing started. So we are all TOSAs, as you could tell by our wonderful cheer to start us off today, um, for the Fullerton School District. Yay, Fullerton! Woo! Built-in crowd, perfect. We made it happen. Um, and so uh, we are all new to this position this year. We all stepped out of the classroom for the first time. So it's been an adventure, shall you say, this year, um, but a wonderful adventure at that. Um, so I am Pablo Diaz, and you can contact me at uh, Teach Using Tech uh, on Twitter. And I am stepping out of the classroom this year after about uh, 13 years in sixth grade, predominantly in math, um, science, and technology. Hi, everybody. My name is Ann Cosma, and my Twitter handle is AnnCosma723. I'm stepping out of the classroom after 10 years at Valencia Park School in Fullerton, and I've got a lot of my hoot loot friends right over there. <laughs> so the past four years, I've taught in an iPad one-to-one -one classroom with my first graders, and now part of our job is helping support 700 incredible teachers in the Fullerton School District and supporting about 14,000 students. So there's a lot of exciting and innovative things happening, and I'm glad to be a part of it. And my name is Holly Steele. I'm stepping out of the classroom after nine years teaching junior high science, seventh and eighth grade at Beechwood School um, with this wonderful man over here, Pablo Diaz. So um, we went on this journey together this year. So we are here today to look at the use of technology in our classrooms. And if someone told you that technology was a magic bullet that was going to magically make your classroom better, they were wrong and you probably figured that out. Um, because adding technology to your classroom will not magically make it better all on its own, because... You know, even Harry Potter had to go to Hogwarts. So we have to learn to be good users of technology as teachers. So here we are pictured with Dr. Ruben Puentadura, who, um, so pretty cool, right? And uh, he's the <laughs> creator, if you don't know, he is the creator of the SAMR model. Um, owns a consulting firm to help transform education. And one of the main reasons we put this up here, is I think it gives us a little street cred. Right? That's, that's, that's one of the major reasons. Our but, mentor. Uh, we have, we yeah, he guy. is our mentor. He, he, has a great, um, he has a great website, so if you, if you need some resources, look up Dr. Ruben Puentadura. So why is SAMR important? SAMR is really a tool for us to reflect on our intentional use of technology in our classroom. So that's sort of our focus for today. So I want to just explain SAMR a little bit and help you understand it. Really, we're here today to introduce you to the SAMR model and help you uh, understand what the different levels are. Give me a hands up if you're already familiar with SAMR. Ah, hey, so I can skip this part and go a lot faster. Basically, what we're doing today is talking about the differentiation between what goes on under the line when the technology is enhancing and what goes on above the line as we're talking about technology transforming teaching and learning in the classroom. So in our presentation, we're going to show you examples, help you get a vision for what um, transformation above the line looks like, and show you what ed tech examples in a K-8 setting look like across the SAMR continuum. So another thing we talk about in Fullerton, and I just want to put this out there, we talk a lot about the TPAC model too. Are people familiar with TPAC? Okay, so not as many hands up, but what this is. How about is... Tupac? <laughs> okay, there you go. Mostly, of course. So TPAC is another example where you're blending the technology with your pedagogical content and your, or your pedagogical skills and content knowledge. And the ideal would be to mix and land yourself right in the sweet spot in the center where all of those things are combined. In the where, Anne? Well, Pablo calls it the sweet potato spot, but I call it the sweet spot. He likes potatoes a little much, he says. I do. So understanding SAMR and TPAC, or T TUPAC, uh, TPAC allows us educators to develop skills that essentially are necessary for um, improvement to the whole world, outside the world, and especially outside of our classrooms. And I think that's really important as we, we take this journey through, through SAMR, um, that those 21st century skills are developed throughout and, and, and very much focused throughout 
the process. Don't confuse the four C's with four C's of the common core. That really doesn't exist, but once I said that on accident, just because it's what I said, and they've never let me live it down. So we never. just call them the four C's, right? Of common core? Nope, just the four oh, C's. Darn. So um, for me, I wanted to explain a little bit about why I think SAMR is meaningful from an educator lens. And the whole idea of using technology in my classroom was because I wanted my students, my students to produce content rather than just consume it. And you might have already seen this infographic on the top. It's Bill Ferreter. And this has sort of been widely um, distributed among social media. And it talks about what do we want kids to do with technology. Right answer, wrong answer. Of course, the right answers would be things like raise awareness. Find answers to their questions. We want to motivate our students to not only ask questions, but to find the answers to their questions. Uh, we want them to make a difference. We want them to drive action, dri take action and drive change. And I found this graphic on the left side, and I love this because I want you to think about your students as producers. Think about your students as scholars, as creators, as researchers, as performers, as designers. And we want to motivate our students uh, the technology isn't the toy in the classroom that motivates them, it's the tool that motivates them for opportunities to make a difference in the world. And for opportunities, like I said, to ask and answer their own questions and motivated by opportunities to learn together with like-minded peers. So I thought that graphic was really cool and I wanted to make sure I shared it with you. So we also want to look at SAMR as a way to bring voice and choice into the classroom. And, you know, we want our students to have their own authentic voice and to understand that they have the power to make a difference in the world around them and to have them work on developing that sense of agency through our use of technology with our students. And so that's a big piece of using technology to promote student voice. It's also a lot easier to give students choice in their learning um, when we have tools in our hand. So, I wanted to tell you a funny little story about one evening, um, another time we were with Dr. Pontadura, and we've only been together twice, so it's not like we're superstars or anything. Um, but we had the opportunity, Holly and I were able to go out to dinner with him, with some of the principals from the Fullerton School District, and we were walking down the street, and he goes, can I ask you a question? And I said, of course. And he said, do your students know what the letters in SAMR stand for? So I was walking and I stopped and I said, no. And he said, why not? And it, it stopped me in my tracks and I thought, I don't know. I don't, I don't know why I've never used those words in the classroom with my students, but I'm going to tomorrow. And of course we laughed. But the idea of talking about SAMR, not only as a school staff, in your learning community, in your classrooms, in your schools, in your school districts. We're building a common language. And it's that mutual understanding of what transformation we're trying to help support in the classrooms, in the school districts. SAMR's the umbrella over it. Why not let your students know S stands for substitution? A, augmentation, M, modification, R, redefinition. So what we did was create a freebie for you. And this is your Q15 above the line swag, OK? So notice in the bottom corner, you have a little freebie you can click on. And it's just a little poster you could hang in your room. And it'll be memories of Q15 for you. But it also could just be a spot that you could point your students to and say, you guys, we're trying to get above the line. We really, really want to transform what's going on with these learning tools that, that we're so lucky to have. This is your enduring freebie from Q15, unlike the SAMR bar, which you've probably already eaten. Oh, yeah. Who got a SAMR bar? That was my lunch. Who needs a SAMR bar? Where's my SAMRette? Thank you, Kim Bass in the right back. Right there. Yes, thank you. <laughs> SAMRette. <laughs> Why not? Um, so we're going to go ahead and walk through one kind of complete example across the SAMR um, model. Um, and we're going to use um, English language arts, and we're going to use the book report. And my colleagues have an interesting sense of humor because they left the English language arts book report to the science teacher. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't think that was a very good idea. But perhaps if my teachers had known about SAMR um, and there had been better technology, um, maybe I would have actually liked English language arts more than I do now. So um, let's talk about that book report, shall we? So here is our non-tech example. You know, we're using traditional paper and pencil. I hear they exist still. Someone told me that. Um, but you know, we have these old templates that students could fill out, um, and this could be their book report. Does this look like fun? Are you having fun yet? Are you having fun now? Yeah, me neither. <laughs> All right. Um, so if we were to look at um, a substitution example, um, so if we were to look at um, a traditional kind of substitution, literally we're substituting a keyboard for paper and pencil. And so now I am typing my lovely book report. So why does this have at least some form of enhancement? Well, as a junior high teacher, you know how much time we spent trying to decipher the writing of children? Oh my <laughs> goodness gracious. So First I can grade? finally, yeah, I don't know how you do that. That's like a whole nother language. Yeah, it is another language. Um, so at least here, like now I can read it. So that's happy, right? But have I really transformed the learning experience for my students yet? No, not yet. Um, if we move us up to the next step and we look at augmentation, now I want to start to look at some slightly different experiences. So now um, I have a lovely plot diagram. Do I have any English language arts teachers in the room? Yay, ELA. Yay, so you probably know a lot better than I do, but we have the exposition, the rising action, the climax, the falling action, and the resolution, also known, apparently, as the denouement. What? Remember? The what? Yeah, the, the, the denouement. You didn't know that one? Believe it or not, I, the science ELA teacher, student. was the only person who actually knew that term. I know. So it's typed. Yay, I can see it. Um, <laughs> this is great. And now the student has been able to add in some media, at least, to support their text as well. So getting a little better, right? Would we call this transformative, though? Yeah, no. Don't think so. Um, so let's take it a step further. And here we have a student who has made a book trailer. Okay, Because students, well, sometimes they like to read. Sometimes they don't. But I guarantee you they will like to read that which their friends recommend way more often than what you recommend. And so here we have students who have used their digital media strategically and capably, as outlined in the ELA capacities for the Common Core. Did you know that? <laughs> Science teacher knew that. No, just kidding. But really, um, here we're using digital media to support um, an understanding of what this book would look like. And why not take it then and put it attached to a QR code and put it on the back of your book in the library? And then any kid could walk up to that book scan the back cover and get a little book trailer, a little tease of what that book could look like. Um, and that becomes a lot more meaningful and they brought in their audience as well. Getting cooler, right? Yeah. Um, if you didn't want to use just the general iMovie um, itself, you could um, perhaps use instead the actual trailers in iMovie. If you have not explored these trailers, they are wonderful. Um, and there's a little shout out here to a wonderful gentleman by the name of Tony Vincent Tony from Vincent. Learning at Hand. Yeah. And he put together a series of um, templates. They're actually PDF documents, which you could print if you really wanted to. I don't know why you would. Um, but you can fill them out. And if you've ever worked with trailers with kids, they have a really hard time figuring out how to make really good use of all of those spaces and all those boxes. And what do I put in this box? And what do I put on this text line? And these um, templates do a really good job of helping students plan that out beforehand so that you get really nice, polished, finished products. And there's a link to them there because you can click on that in the presentation. But really, we want to talk about what does it look to redefine the teaching and learning experience in our classrooms. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about Google Tour Builder. Um, it is a web-based tool that uses the Google Earth um, technology, um, and it lets you put together your own tour. Anyone ever done Google Tour Builder in here? It's a pretty cool little process, and it's not hard. It just takes like a couple tries, and you figure it out. Um, but I could take this Google Tour Builder and continue with my book report theme and make a Google Lit Trip. So Google Lit Trips, as I found out, um, were actually made by a former Google certified teachers and this was something that they put together. Um, in a Google Lit Trip, um, you put together a bunch of different kinds of media. Can you go ahead and hit play on this yeah. one, Ann? And so here we have a Google Lit Trip for the diary um, of Anne Frank. And it's actually quite 
bit longer than this, but they have the little video clip of the only video clip ever um, found that includes Anne Frank, and she's leaning out a, a balcony waving. It was during someone's um, wedding, I believe is the yeah. story of it. And it takes you to the actual street where she was. So now I can see on the left is the video, on the right is the actual place. And you can actually tag all these real-time places and put them together in sequence and have your students go on a Google-lit trip. And that's pretty cool. Now I have my students that are creating and authoring their own learning experience, not just for themselves, but for others around them too. And I think for a lot of our students who may be in places where they don't ever leave their local communities, this is a chance for them to broaden out and reach out and see a bigger world beyond them. So we gave you four examples here um, along kind of the book reports, so to speak, for SAMR. Um, but what we really need to recognize is that SAMR is not always so neat and clean and discreet and tidy. And sometimes it's really hard to figure out where something belongs on the SAMR continuum. And some of you SAMRites out there might be thinking, well, that wasn't augmentation. That wasn't modification, but that's not the point. We do need to recognize that it's a continuum. And even though it may be a little hard to tell where something belongs, what we still can focus our energy on is understanding the difference between technology to enhance learning, which is below the line, and technology to really transform the learning and teaching process um, for our students, and that is working above the line. My last slide for a while, and then I get to stop talking. Oh my gosh, I'm excited. <laughs> um, so one of the things is we're not always gonna be working and teaching above the line. It's not a practical thing, and we wanna shoot for that. We wanna aim for teaching and learning above the line, but it's not always practical. And we love this quote, always shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. That's from Les Brown, and as a science teacher, I have to say I kinda of have a beef with this, because if I shoot for the moon and miss, I'm coming back to Earth. <laughs> not going to the stars, because the stars are a lot farther away than the moon. But I appreciate the sentiment behind the quote regardless, but I just have to say, as a science teacher, it kind of bugs. But I'm going to let it go. So we shoot for the stars. We shoot for the stars, if and if we miss, we'll land them on the moon. I don't get it. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, Pablo. So this is the um, part of the presentation. She said she gets to take a break. They were teasing me last night. A long night. break. Long I have 19 break. slides that I want to get through. Um, and so this is where you can settle in, relax, <laughs> enjoy your iced tea, and here we go. I want to talk with you and share uh, ideas across the, the continuum from a, a primary perspective. So I'm a first grade teacher out of the classroom and we are talking about math. So of course, here's our little non-tech example, right? Paper pencils, those special little red and uh, yellow counting dots that we use for everything on our 10 frames in first grade. Um, but I wanted to talk with you now about substitution. Anyone familiar with Notability? This is a great tool. Give That's, Notability some love. It's yeah, awesome, isn't Notability it? Notability can do obviously more than substitution, but it's a great substitute for annotating PDFs, right? So that, I mean, which is fantastic, but literally it's just a tool substitute, right? So instead of using a pencil, you now substitute your finger. Or a stylus. Or a stylus, if you would like to be more precise. So here's another example of substitution, and the, this little kindergarten girl from Valencia Park is doing domino addition, and um, we teach our students, obviously, add and plus add and equal sum, so she's illustrating that on her Doodle Buddies uh, writing, and you can see in the bottom corner, the smaller picture, as kindergarten students are learning one-to-one -one correspondence, the Doodle Buddy app has really cute little stamps that they can just stamp across their papers. Again, a great substitute. Enhancing, right? Not transforming. So, Let's get into augmentation. And I wanted to point out to you that Google Forms are a, a great way to begin to augment things like a math quiz. And um, my classroom had a high population of English learner students, and I wanted to support my students who had pre-reading skills and weren't necessarily uh, fluent readers yet, and I used a lot of visual support for math, for math quizzes and things like that, so I would use a Google Form, but I would embed pictures into my Google Form. So if anyone's curious what like a, a visual Google Form math test might look like, you can uh, follow the link, or if anyone's interested in taking a math test right now, there's the link, right? So I promise, 
you'll probably get 100% on it, right? We hope. <laughs> we hope. So the next part would be uh, another example of augmentation. And I wanted to uh, introduce some of my favorite primary math apps that we used in the classroom to improve math skills, but also um, facts fluency. So on the top, we have an app called Math Magic. There's a component word or a, a partner to it, Word Magic, which is also good. Math Bingo, again, there's Word Bingo. Uh, underneath Math Train, those were like the go-tos that my first graders loved in using on their iPod Touch four years ago and even still to um, this day, I'm assuming they're using in the classroom at VP. But the other one I wanna point out, um, this is from four years ago, the picture. We used Flash to Pass to help our students increase the automaticity with their math facts. And uh, we just did the Flash to Pass Olympics where we would just track how, how, how many kids passed in a, um, with accuracy, right? but just kept track of the times and we had that posted in the classroom just for a fun little thing, so. I wanna to talk to you now above the line, okay? So we're talking about modification and we know modification of the SAMR model is when we begin to redesign the learning task. These two apps are like MVPs in a K6 setting that, that I know and seventh, eighth obviously are perfect for as well. Strip design on the left, that's like the MVP at VP K6. It's used for so many things. I'm gonna give it an award. I'm gonna make it a little batch. And 30 hands, of course, the free version. Free is good. Strip design was not a free app, but I wanna, I wanna showcase it anyways. So I want my students to be mathematicians and I want them to explore and analyze data and I want it to be fun and engaging and innovative for them. So of course, what do we do around Valentine's Day? We graph our candy hearts, probably like most primary classrooms in all the land, right? Um, so I had my students start taking pictures as they were creating their graphs. Why? They could still hold on to the data that they were collecting then we began to make strip design comics where they got to import the data that they had collected from the activity. So that's what that slide shows. The next slide shows the same thing, but this time with lucky charms, right? So February, March, and guess what we did in April? We did the same thing with jelly beans, but we changed the project a little bit. So uh, I love the picture on the left, oh, right there. It's just, you're capturing those moments where you know the students are analyzing data, but they're engaged in the process. So uh, redesign the task. It's not substitution, it's not augmentation. It was a redesigned way for us to analyze the math data. So I wanna talk about another example. Holly pointed out I seemed to use a lot of food in my classroom. A lot of food, right? Um, this food, they were not, they were only allowed to take home the packaged ones because the ones that they touched and fell on the floor, Ew. of course. We didn't eat them, so we didn't just eat candy all day in room four, okay? We didn't, I promise. So she says. So 30 hands, I love, because the students get to add a component where their voice is recorded and you capture their authentic voice and they are the curators of their content now and they're presenting the data that they're collecting and analyzing to a much larger audience, so. Um, I've got a freebie in here, you guys, top right corner, that links you to an 11-page PDF of this project if you're interested or in a primary classroom, even if you're in sixth grade, but you want to see what it is, it's there for you, and it's um, the projects that the paper, the frame, what the kids what they worked through. So enjoy that freebie for you. Um, I want to show you why I feel like this was modification, we're beginning to share it out with a much broader, well, we would showcase it in our classroom, right, and share it with the audience. Students could present their movies in the classroom. And I'm gonna start the video, I'm not gonna play the whole thing because it's about two minutes. Um, you can click on the YouTube link and it'll take you to my YouTube channel. I don't have a ton of things up there, but I put this example up there for you to see, so. No sound? They're a really, a little girl sad. named Haley is talking right now, and she's saying, "Hi, I'm Haley." So we we're going to go to the next slide. Before. Yeah, we checked it before, but, anyways, the link is there. You can watch it at your leisure. So, 
Um, she's really I wanna, cute. Say just it so again? you know, she's really cute. Oh, first grade. It's like the power really of cute. little kid cuteness, right? So um, I want to get above modification and go into redefinition now. Do we want to? Again, the arrows right here. The arrow. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's the arrows. I was at Q a couple years ago, and this was the 2013 conference, and I walked out of a session on iBooks Author and was so excited about creating a book in iBooks Author, and I said to my colleagues from Valencia Park, oh my gosh, you guys, I'm so excited, I'm so excited, and Kyle Myers, who's sitting right there, said, look at this. And he pulled out the $20 bill and he launched Erasma and he showed me what happens when you use augmented reality. So those two words, augmented reality, changed everything for me. And I thought, well, I know what my takeaway from this conference is this time. And I went back into the classroom. Holly, would you advance the slide? I got distracted, sorry. <laughs> I went back into the classroom and um, I had seen something that encouraged me to um, give my students greater voice in, in sharing what they were learning and um, I wanted to capture those authentic learning moments. So I said to my students, we were doing double digit edition and I said, you guys get to pick any strategy you want. Prove to me you know how to solve that problem. Again, this is first grade math, but think about it. What I did was give them a piece of paper, they chose the problem, I said, go prove it. He illustrated how he solved the problem, and then I said, come here and I'm gonna record you, so prove it, here we go. And I just videotaped him explaining his process to me, and then we used Erasma, and I used his work image on the left as the trigger image and embedded the video of him explaining the, how he solved the equation as the overlay. So when people would walk into the classroom and they would scan the pictures and the video would pop up, that was like the jaw-dropping moment for so many of the parents and people who came into our classroom when the little kid's video popped out of the math work that they were doing. So I know we have a Fullerton teacher here, Mr. Mosley, who loves Erasma, and that's coming up later in the show. Um, but here's just some pictures Give them the opportunity and the freedom to prove their understanding to you and capture those moments and, and share them. And I chose to do that with um, Erasma. I wanted to show, show me and Miss Lupe Escobar, who's sitting right over there, uh, if you're interested, she has about 250 incredible student-created, student-curated projects on Show Me. There's a link to there, but why not give the kids an opportunity? Again, I'm talking math examples. Prove to me you know how to solve for area and perimeter. They have the freedom to illustrate their learning. They record the video. You can play this video. Um, I'm not going to play this one, but it's linked in there. And it's one of her students explaining how to solve this type of problem. Redefinition with the GeoBoard app, right? So you might think it looks just well, kind of like a It looks a little bit like substitution, doesn't it? Like it totally just substituting like a digital geo board for a real geo board? But it's not just substitution because I had my kids do more with it, right? We created shape robots and we were studying geometry and I wanted to know the attributes and characteristics of geometric shapes. So what my students did was create shape robots but we used 30 hands and again they were curating movies that were ex uh, explaining the characteristics of geometric shapes. And then we began, we began to share our content outside of the classroom via QR code. And when you make the classroom flat and you share your content, the, the collaborative piece just grows exponentially and kids from other classrooms could come learn. People from outside of the school would come and learn. We could share it with family members who lived in different locations because we could email it to them or the students would take their work home and when grandma was visiting, grandma could see their work. So uh, it wasn't just substitution, but this is maybe a great example of a project that kind of could fit in lots of places along the continuum. Um, but in first grade, I thought this was a great opportunity to uh, create something with my students or have them create it that was previously inconceivable. We had never made this before. 
Um, another example I recently saw um, was how they used the GeoBoard app, but they were app smashing with Adobe Voice, using their QR code creator on their, on their iPad, and then Pic Collage, again coming back to area and perimeter, sharing via QR code, but the students used the GeoBoard app to write um, their name. And then they made a movie about it in Adobe Voice, so I think the next one is the example, I just took some little screenshots, you can see some of her slides. All right, so just to summarize this, right? Uh, uh, uh. Okay, you guys got that. Um, so let's take a look at uh, the SAMR model in, in kind of a different outlook. So uh, this is for you coffee you know, aficionados out there, but don't go to sleep on me if you're, you don't like coffee and you hate it and everything else. But the idea is if you, if you buy a coffee, let's say, over at, I don't know, 7-Eleven, it's the run-of-the-mill coffee, what have you, you buy one over at Starbucks, there's, there's no functional change here, right? You, you have coffee, all right? But then we want to augment that coffee by maybe ordering a latte, right? So we get that latte, we're really enjoying that latte, right? And then, but we want to bump it up a little bit more on the SAMR model, of course, because that's what you're thinking of when you go buy coffee, right? And you're going to order a caramel macchiato. I have the toughest time. I mean, I drink the stuff, but I'm not really good with all the names and such. Does anybody have a good favorite drink they like to drink? Yell it out. Chai latte. I know there's some longer ones. Temperament mochas, all right, so I digress, sorry. And then finally, you know, you put all the sugar on top and you got that, that pumpkin spice uh, latte, basically. But the idea is to continue to build and increase the capacity of the student and the teacher as you're working through this SAMR model. Um, so I'm going to speak on SAMR in history and, social, and the social sciences. So here we have basically a regular old worksheet which we can annotate and draw on. So this is the non-tech model. The only tech that was the, the only tech that we used was the printer to print it on or from. So that's that's not too bad there. But let's go from that non-tech piece to another non-tech piece. Although that's pretty well done there on the left, isn't it? I mean, that's pretty. I, I like it. It's on. It's even on lined paper. Kind of interesting, right? But it's well done. It's it's, it's, so on the, on the higher levels of creativity or on the le levels of like Bloom's taxonomy, it's up there in creativity wise. But as far as the SAMR model is concerned, it's on the lower level. Now we can just take a picture of that, so just using the camera roll, and get it in digital form. So now I sim I'm, I'm, on, I'm moving, right? I'm, I can use it for a later, um, a later project as such, but we're, we're really moving now through the SAMR model, right? Now I want to mention here that a few, uh, many of these projects, products, activities are just a movement away, adding something, okay, adding a piece of technology and moving it from something like substitution to augmentation all the way to redefinition. So again, it is a continuum and we need to keep that in mind. And again, I want to say, and it's been mentioned here before, that whether you live in, you shouldn't live in substitution, but it's okay to start there and it's okay to go back to substitution. Sometimes you just have to. So here we have another, another example of uh, basically just using something in the browser or uh, your web-based area so we can make uh, a timeline on a timeline generator. So that's another way to create a timeline. And so um, the image you saw before was also just a timeline of American history. But there is no functional change here. Okay, we just have substitution. Students um, can also create um, a digital timeline by, again, using that paper-based um, initial product and go ahead and scan it into a note-taking app like, this one's called, it's a mouthful, Metamoji Lite, formerly known as Note Anytime. And then over here, this is Skitch. We do have links at the end of the um, presentation to all of these resources if you've not heard of them and then you can download these. And again, these are iOS apps. I'm not sure if Skitch is multi-platform or not, but nonetheless, what's that? Perfect. Um, but again, there is no, so I annotated this in Skitch, took a picture of it, made some dots, made a legend. You know, if I'm a student, then there is no functional change yet. And then we get 
to augmentation. In augmentation, what we want is we want, and the next three examples are presentation examples. So things like here I'm using ThingLink. This is device agnostic. It's web-based, but you can also ha use the ThingLink app. And basically students just inputted links, whether they be movies, um, just text, or links to other products, but they weren't necessarily created by them, they were just curated by them. And that's somewhat the difference when we're talking about augmentation to modification. Um, go ahead and, go to the next slide. and so the next one is Keynote and or PowerPoint. Again, we have images here that were inserted. Um, there is a functional change, but we're not quite yet to modification. And then another um, resource would be Haiku Deck. Again, this can be uh, done online, another presentation tool where we can add text and images, again, similar to PowerPoint, Keynote, or any other presentation tool, again, in augmentation. Then we move into modification. If you look up there, we do have a, a worksheet initially that was, yeah, you can play that. So, and what you'll see now is well, we went from a worksheet to we went from a worksheet to um, using, I, we specifically used iMotion HD, which is a time-lapse photography app. So, but any time-lapse photography would work. And so students are creating these things for civil, some certain Civil War battle, battles that happen across time. So they can identify and see where the density was of, let's say, um, Union victories versus Confederate victories and so on, okay? After this is completed, they create a movie. That movie is then um, pushed into a um, movie editing app, such as iMovie, but any, any will, will do. And they narrated and explained the process or what they were seeing over the course of the time of those battles. Does that make sense? So we're certainly in modification, and with a few tweaks, and some could, again, this continuum, could, some could argue that this is redefinition as well. She's remembering the arrow. Job, Thank you guys, thanks for that encouragement. And so finally, um, this is, um, uh, I want to talk about Mr. Mosley's uh, fourth grade class. Mr. Mosley, raise your hand. Mr. Yep. Mosley yes, rocks. Yes, Mr. Mosa. Um, so in, in this process, what you see is he has a uh, virtual or a digital wall, let's say, or interactive wall. And on that wall, the, the process started in the lower level substitution, but he, his students went through, through all the processes of SAMR. So you can go ahead and play that and turn down the sound. Um, oh, there is no sound, so perfect. Um, so uh, the students basically researched, um, researched their topic on California. They had specific topics in the California region. And then what the students did was they collaborated on Google Docs. So that's a higher level of SAMR right there. So they went from substitution kind of instead of looking in, remember the encyclopedias we used to look through to kind of research a things? What? Encyclopedias. What's that? Paper-based things that you flip back and forth. They have little letters in the inside. Joey Tribbiani on the only had the letter V encyclopedia on Friends. So okay. She loves Friends. Um, so anywho, um, students basically were uh, substituting things like encyclopedias for, let's say, Google, right? And we're searching. And then they pushed all that information, though, to Google Docs. As soon as they did that and shared it with one of their teammates or group members, then we're talking about a higher level um, in the area of the four C's, or collaboration in this case, and uh, communication. So um, after that happened, the students took that information and created a script and took a, a green screen with the area of where they were at, right, in, in, in California for their topic, and they presented that script and did their whole thing on green screen. From green screen there, that green screen movie that they created, they went ahead and pushed that into, now this is what Ann was so happy about two years ago at Q, and Mr. Mosley is using in his classroom, and that's augmented reality. Taking that movie, placing it on a wall, and it jumps out at you, right? So now you're kind of interacting with the content, and that's augmented reality. So we, he took them through SAMR, even if he didn't know it. He took him through summer, but I know Mr. Mosley knows that he took him through summer. Did, did you follow all that? That was, said no. that was quite the train of thought. Did you follow all that? And that's really what Mr. Mosley told me last night. <laughs> yes. No. 
Yeah, no, I've been in his classroom. He has a great classroom. It's very interactive, and he, he does a great job. Can I just point out the chart on the wall, too? Those are all augmented. So when the kids want either a reteaching moment or they want to review the, the, the whatever they're studying, they can just go up and scan the charts in the room and get the videos that their peers content that they've created and I thought that was so cool for a teaching moment. I know there's lots of teachers out there that make teaching charts and here's your vocabulary chart. Take two minutes, film yourself, embed it in there and that becomes a reteaching tool that you have in the classroom available always for your students. So when we're looking at teaching above the line, oftentimes you see kind of two common themes that weave through. Um, one of it is using, well the term, the official term is app smashing, um, to bring together lots of different kinds of media. And here we're really looking at students curating their own student created content. Um, it could have been through something like a thing like that Pablo mentioned. Um, but instead of linking to media that other people have created, it's what they've created themselves. So they're curating their own content. Um, one of the other common themes is you see a lot of, you know, broadening our students' audience. And we really talked earlier about voice and giving our students a voice. And why not leverage the power of social networking to give our students a much broader voice than they would have otherwise? So when we look at this, we want to think about the what, the why, and the how. And that is, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And how are we using the tools that we have access to um, the best way that we possibly can? And SAMR is a good way for us to think about that um, with purpose and with intention. So this is like, we couldn't remember the name of this game, but you know the picture game? SAMR is a tool, tool. to help you reflect on your teaching practice. So SAMR is a great tool for us to reflect on our own teaching practice and to make sure that we're using technology in a way that is transformative and not just in a way that enhances learning. Does anybody remember that game or the name? We could or not. It? It's not Pictionary. That's we what we thought too, but that's drawing. I don't yeah. know. We just All right, we'll have we a discussion later Whatever. about this. Yeah. Thank you, Susie. So in truth, what we've been wanting to just convey to you, it's not the tech that you're using in your classroom, right? I don't have to push the button this time. Say it again, so, please. I know. The, the past 45 minutes, what we've been trying to say, it's not the tech that you're using in your classroom. It's, it's how, how you, you use, use it. it. Right? We, uh, we, uh, so no. Oh, we're not done. We're not done. <laughs> <laughs> no. Not yet. Um, so I'm I know you've already <laughs> marked your next session, but wait. I'm super excited to, for the closing keynote for Q this year. You guys, it's Adam Bello who's doing the closing keynote. And I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to see him. We saw him at ISTE in San Antonio, and he is incredible. But I love when Edutopia puts these little things up on Facebook that, you know, they're inspirational thoughts or, or some sort of comment. And... What you do as educators in your classroom every day truly is changing the world. So we're all in this together and the idea of, um, you know, redefining what teaching and learning looks like in your classroom, we're, we're all in this together, but you, you are helping to change the world every single day and we're glad you're a part of, a part of the journey with us. So. Um, there are some resources we have available to you. The shortened URL links, I think, just right back to this presentation. But um, those of you who are interested in possibly uh, introducing what SAMR stands for in your classroom, this is a really cool POW tune that some students have created. And we didn't want to take the time to just play it because it's about three or four minutes, I think. But it's a really fantastic student curated video you could use as a resource in your classroom to introduce what it is to your students. Um, the next one is just another great introduction to the SAMR model. Those of you, I know almost the whole room said they were familiar with it and we didn't really go through the levels of what they mean because I got the impression you already know what they mean. But use it and help your students know what those letters mean as well, right? And again, remember, you have that freebie. It's your um, 
memory from Q15, right? So when you, and when you get to the top of that ladder, hold on tight, because it's quite the ride. It's quite the ride. This picture, by the way, is what happens when you put together three TOSAs after hours in an office with lots of green butcher paper, a tripod, an iPad, and a lovely green screen app. And, and those look like clouds strategically placed up there and the blue sky, but no, that's just bad lighting. So one, one it's thought... It's just a tip, a secret. One thought, too, you into my we world, because we we're one, friends. One thought before we go on. We, well... I'm a rule follower, so when we were creating this presentation, we were given some guidelines in terms of how to build our keynote because they're recording it to share with everyone out there. Hi, people. Um, but we really wanted to redefine this presentation for you. And I know it, you guys have been sitting here for almost an hour now, and you've been a great audience. But here, think here. about possibly not presenting in this format. We didn't want you to have to sit at chairs for an hour, but we thought, oh, we can't, we, we can't leave this screen. But we were in this room for the first session this morning, sitting in a kumbaya circle on the floor. So next time, don't go traditional, redefine. Right? We felt a little silly, I must say. We thought we had to stay up here, and then first session, they didn't. <laughs> hmm. That'll teach us for next time. So this is our last slide. There is the short link to this presentation is here, and everything within it is um, clickable, so all the links are linked in. All the app icons are all linked in and so on. And then in the upper left corner is the QR code to the Q session evaluation, which you can also get online um, at the SCED website. And because sharing is caring, grab a SAMR bar on your way out and share them with your conference buddies. So thanks for coming, Thank you very everybody. much, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.